So now it's like, okay, can I just loan you, Dad? Yeah. And that's my life. And that's the way it's supposed to be. What do you think it was with Christ? He's online with God 24-7. From the moment he was born, Hebrews 10-5. Body you prepared for me. You, Father. So that's the difference in the God deed pattern versus the good deed pattern. The self just, I don't know, doesn't matter anymore. Whereas in the good deed pattern, you are your own God. And, and you're constantly trying to get the approval of, of others who are really the God over you because their opinion over you is how you determine your opinion of yourself. So it's their opinion of you and your opinion of yourself, which is really a slave to their opinion of you. And you're tied up in knots the whole time, trying to do bigger and bigger and bigger good deeds to get lesser and lesser and lesser pleasure. And at the end of your life, you could do the greatest good deed on the planet and it won't give you any pleasure at all. The same thing as murder. Whereas in the God deed side, I'm not doing nothing. And I don't care. I don't matter to me. I just, I don't matter. You ask, Brandon, what do you want out of life? Learning God, that's it. Well, what about you as a person? Are you a good person? I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'm a putz. I always think I'm a putz. So what? I don't have to live for being a good person. I get to live to know God. So what do I care what I am as a person? God doesn't care. He took care of the problem 2,000 years ago. So I can spend my time thinking about something else. Do I think I'm a good person? No, actually. I think I'm a, I'm a putt. I have no... I, I couldn't tell you one good thing about me. Not one. But I don't matter. I don't have to matter. I can spend my life, good or bad or indifferent, just looking at him and learning him. Now, every single human being and every speck of dust on this planet is a tool of God that he uses his way to do whatever it is he wants. And those of us who have souls are tools of God with volition. And he does what he wants with or without us. But we get to participate if we want. And our participation is merely to say yes. And frankly, you have no idea what God's doing to you, neither do I. Sometimes you find out snippets of it. Some You make a video and somebody comes on your video and says, Oh, I really got something out of that brother. Okay, well you have no idea what they got out of it, but you're grateful and you didn't cause it. God must have. For he did whatever he did with those words that happened to come out of your mouth to them. And so maybe you learned something more about what he did do to them, but you know he did it, not you. And so you learn more about him that way. Okay, fine. That's really good. Why breathe? You got the good deed side. If you go to the good deed side, they say, well, you should breathe in order to be a good person so everybody will think well of you and speak well of you after you're dead. The Greeks were real big on that. If you go and battle with Troy, they will be talking about this battle for a thousand years and your name will live on. So bleeping what? Are you getting any benefit out of that? No. I mean, it's, it's a show game. The whole damn thing is a show game. If you do this good deed, people will think well of you. We'll put your name on a building. Yeah, but you're not there to enjoy it. And your name on a building? Hello, so what? Oh, we're going to dedicate a chair at a university to Mrs. McGillicuddy because she gave a million dollars to the university. Your name is on a chair. How many people see that chair? Okay, well, maybe it's the kind of chair that's an endowment. The, the Mrs. McGillicuddy Chair of Social Studies. So? Your name is on a chair. Your name is on an endowment program. Your name is on a building. Your name is on a street. 
first of all, it's just your name. It's not you. And the people meant, well, they meant to honor you, and they think they're doing a good deed for you by sticking your name on a chair or a building or a street. Now, countless people are going to have to spend time learning the proper spelling of your name so they can find that street, find that chair, write to get money, find that building. And that's all you mean to them. They don't know anything about you. And even if they learn about you, so what? You're dead. You can't enjoy them learning about you or talk to them. You see how a good deed is no good at all? It does nothing. Zero. So the thing that matters about what you do is the intrinsic value of what you do, irrespective of whether anybody else sees it or approves of it or not. Because you're the one doing it. I'm spending time on this audio. Some people would call that a good deed. I don't. What am I getting out of this audio right now? Because, honey, whatever you get out of it had to come from God. It's not coming from me. I'm not doing anything for you. I hope you get something out of it, but it's up to God whether you do or not. And it's His doing if you do. And if you're pleased and you're proud of me or happy about me or you think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, no offense, but so what? What does that do for you, your high opinion of me? And what does it do for me? Ma'am, I don't want you to be unhappy, but it doesn't do anything for either one of us if you have a high opinion of me or not. might do something for you if God does something with the information to you but I don't have anything to do with that and the person you should be happy with is God not me but I'm getting something out of this now so it's worth doing and you might think this audio is the biggest piece of trash you've ever heard and I'm totally blasphemous and you'll mistake talking about Bible as teaching oh women shouldn't teach I'm not teaching honey I'm a witness about what God's done to me and that's all this is he has to make it into something more than that I'm getting something out of it and I hope you do too obviously I don't want you to waste your time but the only thing that's of value in anything you or I do is the intrinsic value of the doing and whether people approve it or not there's no value there And that's the the big shell game that the good deeders get sucked into. They think that because they get approval, that that makes them better persons. They need someone outside them telling them that they're good to feel good about themselves. And that's the extent of their life. With God deeds, it's exactly the opposite. It doesn't matter what I do. I couldn't do anything to please God if if no matter what I do. I could like Paul said in the in the mistranslation of uh, 1 Corinthians um, 13, I think it's verse 3. Even if I give my body over to be burned. That's not what Paul said. It was that was a, the scribe miswrote one letter. So it looks like the word to be burned, but he meant boast. Even if I give up everything so that I may boast. But I don't have love, meaning scripture. The word love there in that chapter means the completion of scripture. Christ's head. He introduced that in uh, 1 Corinthians 12.31 when he uses the word hooperbale. The surpassing. What surpasses the body is the head. Head of Christ. Head of Christ is love thinking of Christ is love that's been his theme of all of 1 Corinthians so he's just furthering the theme since 1 Corinthians 2 without love without Christ's head in mind what does it matter what I give away or what I can do and if I got Christ's head in my head then anything I do well that's satisfying I don't care Because what's more satisfying? Getting his head in my head in whatever I do. I'm writing an email. You know what? That's boring. I'd rather know God's thinking and learn more about God through the email. 
I got to eat breakfast. Okay, bran flakes. I should eat bran flakes because I got to be regular. Okay. But, you know, is life just bran flakes? Or I buy my 16th Maserati. How many Maseratis can you own and be happy with them? They are really wonderful cars. They're very temperamental. Okay. Can I learn something with God? About God by buying my 16th Maserati? Maybe. Then buy the 16th Maserati to learn more about God. But it's not about how good brain out is. It's about learning more about God. My whole life, what's the best? Can I, what can I learn about you, Dad? I want to learn better what should be in my head so that you're hearing something from me you like. I can't even put it in my head. I don't even know what to think. Yeah, so much about me going good deeds doesn't matter. I don't matter to me. I don't have to matter to me. I get to live for God now. That's so he just threw that in my mind. Second Corinthians five twenty five. No, no, no. Second Corinthians five fourteen through twenty one. It's five fourteen starts out with we don't live for ourselves. It, it's mistranslated. It says the love of Christ compels us. The Greek verb there is suneko, it means it holds us together. The love of Christ holds me together. I can be looking at him. I don't have to be looking at me. I don't have to be looking at my performance. I'm looking at his performance. I don't have to be looking at my nature. I'm looking at his nature. Okay, so honey, if I'm busy looking at his nature and his performance, how much am I having my attention on anything that would tempt me to sin? Not very much. Whereas the good deeder, because he has to do bigger and better good deeds to feel the same high about himself in the eyes of others, is going to be more prone to sin, the sin of the good deeds, or the sin of rejecting and rebelling against doing the good deeds, because sooner or later that gets real old. Look at the contrast. The good deeder is entirely focused on himself and entirely focused on the opinion of others. Right down to hair gel and whether you wear a scarf at the next big art exhibition you have to go to in order to appear because people will approve of you if you're at the art exhibition of a guy who paints only blue dogs. That was a big thing in Santa Fe, New Mexico not long ago. This one guy just painted blue dogs, really stupid looking blue dogs. Not even as cute as Huckleberry Finn. Huckleberry Hound. And people were paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because this guy was popular with the, the artsy crowd for painting blue dogs. They had no discernment, those people. They were paying thousands of dollars for an ugly picture of a blue dog that a five-year-old could have drawn in order to get the approval of people because, oh, now you own a blue dog painting like I do. And you have to dress a certain way and you have to hold your wine glass a certain way and you have to know which color of wine it is that goes with what foods or you're not approved by your peers. Bear in mind, most of these people are in their 50s or older. Some of them are in their late 30s. And they, they think that they're good people because they do that. See how the, the discernment goes down the drain when you're busy trying to cater to other people. And what's considered a good or a good deed goes down the drain. And your whole life is run by somebody else's opinion. And your discernment is zero because you're buying a picture of a blue dog. Spending thousands of dollars on a picture of a blue dog. You can Google on that. I, I saw it in an art magazine about... 15 years ago, so maybe it's that old. That's what good deeds does to you. Robs you of discernment, turns you into a total idiot who's totally dependent on everybody else's opinion of you, and God forbid people's opinion of you should lower, because now you, you, you your opinion of yourself is lower, and that's all you have for your life. On the flip side, the intrinsic value of what you do has been redefined as God deeds. So now it's all about God and what does He think and what does He do and most of the time you have no clue what kind of God deeds are happening to you. But it doesn't matter anymore. And you're not thinking about yourself. 
I mean, peripherally, because you got a body and you got to make all kinds of decisions related to yourself. But you want more than that out of life, so now you're trying to turn everything in your life into some kind of vehicle for learning God better during the 23 hours a day you're not spending in Bible class. And of course, you got a lot of Bible at this point to play with all these tools. You're a tool of God, and your Kleenex, you're jumping, you're, you're lifting and throwing down your Kleenex. You're using your mouse. That's, those are tools. What can my mouse teach me about God? Notice what's not happening? I'm not wringing my hands over what a putz I am. I already know I'm a putz. That's a given. So what? I'm not worried about somebody else's opinion of me either. I mean, I don't want to elicit bad opinions by people. I don't want them feeling bad because of what they think of me. Notice the difference in focus there. If someone thinks well of me, the thing that hits my mind when I hear that or see that is I can see their happiness. Their happiness. I, my ego isn't buttressed. My ego isn't even involved. That person was happy from what he heard in my video. I can feel their happiness. I can see it. I can, I can empathize with it. I know what they're thinking. And I'm really glad that they're happy. They're happy. Not what they think of me. Their own happiness. If they're upset, I can see and feel their own unhappiness in whatever their comment is. It doesn't bother me that they don't think well of me. I'm more concerned about how unhappy they are and why. And what do I have to do? And of course, a lot of times the comments I get in my videos are by people who are, um, how do you want to call it? They're legalistic, jealous, whatever. I mean, I know usually why they're saying what they're saying. And then I have to, usually I decide it wrongly, decide what kind of reply to make or make none at all. Because it's a, it's a job. Replying to comments in YouTube is a job. It's a public role, so it's a job. But my own self-worth is really not dependent on what they think. What they think might help me learn something about God better. So it's the same question as for an email or anything else. Okay, God, this person really liked the video. What am I learning as a result of that? What should I reply? That's how my thought pattern goes. I, I don't practice it enough. Or, oh, this person made this really nasty remark. Okay, God, what what am I learning from this? Always to God, to God, to God, to God. It's not about brain out. Brain out doesn't mean anything. I get to breathe in order to see God. That's the meaning of life, and that's what David said in Psalm 139, if they ever translated it properly. In fact, that's what he says. In Psalm 139, 17, and it's even halfway translated rightly, how precious are your thoughts to me. So that's the summing up of what God deeds means. The Holy Spirit brought that first to mind. How precious are your thoughts? David's saying in that psalm, and he started it out very cleverly, and I haven't finished retranslating it yet for YouTube. It's in the Pro-Life Blasphemy series. Um, I think it's episode 6. I'm not sure. Um, David's whole point of departure is first he starts out with in Psalm 139 I didn't exist he also closes the psalm that way I didn't exist but you decreed a house for me meaning his body and he goes he gets real poetic about it and everything but he ends by saying I mean the basic gist of it and I, I'll have to go through this in the videos when I make them David views his life as being born so he can see God's thoughts. David basically is saying, Hi, I get to have a soul and thoughts so I can see your thoughts. And that's how he closes the psalm, Psalm 139, 17. So David valued being David so that he could see God. There's no analysis there about whether David thinks of himself as a good person or whether God even approves of him 
or whether David approves of himself, or whether anybody else approves of David. David's just all wigged out at the end in Psalm 139, 17, with the preciousness of God's thoughts. That's the meaning of life to David. Of course, that's why God promoted him the way he did, too. Because that is the spiritual life. God promotes anybody who's getting it that way. Now, promotion in God's manner is not promotion by the world's standards. Christ walked the earth of a tiny little country that's like 180 miles, you know, from Dan to Beersheba, high to low, high point to low point. And he did it for 33 years. He did it in an age of low technology. And everything that was learned about him was learned by word of mouth, slowly. He didn't run around wearing lots of gold jewelry. He didn't organize revival meetings. He didn't do anything that Christians do to promote. He just walked around, talked to the people nearby, talked to the people who came to visit him. And they came by the thousands sometimes. Not always. But it was by the thousands in a very densely populated small strip of land that everybody passed through. God was real smart when he placed Israel where he did. Everybody would pass through her, and that's how we do. We pass through life. Sometime we're passing through, we hear some things about this God person. And it goes in one ear and out the other. That's how God does it. So when God promotes a person, and Christ is the most promoted person in history, you have to say that. He didn't use any of the flash that Satan wanted him to use in the second temptation. He didn't take over all the economies and politics of the world like Satan asked him to do in the third temptation. And he certainly didn't do some fantastic good deed of feeding the world like Satan asked him to do in the first temptation. In other words, everything that Satan tempted him to do, Christians do routinely, but Christ refused. And God's promotion of him was nothing like what Christians do either. Because Christians are all on the good deed side of the ledger. More and more and more and more and more for less and less pleasure and more and more guilt. Because everything is determined by somebody else's opinion of you. But of course God's opinion of you has absolutely nothing to do with the equation in the good deeder's mind. But in the God deed side, which is what this part of the audio is talking about, It's only about God. Just because. Hi. I have to eat. And I have to pee. And I have to have emails. And I have to work. And it's barring. People's opinions of me. Well fine. So what? They don't really know the facts. And neither do I. So all of our opinions are based on. You know. Partial snippets of information. Who knows? Who cares? Isn't there something more to life than that? How about if I get to know God and just somehow all this stuff can get converted into a Bible class so I can have Bible class 24 hours a day instead of only one? Well, yeah, you can. Matthew 4.4 4, always occurring. 1 John 1.9 1, when you sin, which happens every minute on the minute. Okay. Matthew 4.4 4 is still always occurring because you're using a Bible verse one way or the other. You're living on a word of God one way or the other. So when I'm sinning, I live on a Bible verse by using 1 John 1 9. And when I stop sinning and I'm between sins, I'm learning something about God. And so it's no longer email or moving a mouse or dropping Kleenex. I'm learning something about you, Father. I'm learning something about your son. I'm learning something about the Holy Spirit who likes to call himself mom by using the Hebrew word rachaf, mother hen brooding over her chicks, in Genesis 1-2. Hovering over the waters. Oh, what senses of humor you all have. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. 
Psalm 139, 17. Now that is what God deeds accomplishes. A happy person who's no longer even, you know, hi, I've got to be concerned about myself because I exist, but can I turn my own existence into something more enjoyable, like seeing you? Hello? Answer? Yeah. So that's the ultimate good deeds value versus the ultimate bad deed, good God deeds value. God deeds value, you see God. Good deeds value, you see yourself. And what a slave you are to others' opinion about you, even to the extent of buying a stupid picture of a blue dog because everybody else is doing it. Peace out.